Welcome to the first lecture on chapter 14 of our textbook. This chapter deals with discharge and remedies. Let's begin. As you can tell from the title, there are two distinct topics in our chapter. One is about discharge and the other is about remedies. Uh, these topics actually are a little bit more connected to each other than the type of topics that we had in chapter 13. Um, you could imagine them being in separate chapters, but they also kind of fit nicely together in one chapter. In this first lecture, we're going to discuss the first topic, the topic of discharge. So let's begin. When I hear the word discharge, I usually think about this idea somebody getting fired you were discharged for tardiness or whatever the particular issue is so usually in everyday conversation um, the, the term discharge has a negative connotation but actually in the law it's a positive thing to be discharged from a contractual obligation means you don't have to worry about it anymore you've done all that you needed to do it's a done deal you can move on with your life so keep in mind that for our purposes we're not thinking about it as a termination uh, of employment situation, but we're thinking about it as no longer having that obligation under the contract that no longer continues. So let's look at how we actually get the discharge. How do we accomplish this goal? Because that's what we ultimately want. And we have five methods that we're going to talk about today. And the first method is performance. Okay, well, we're not talking about a nutcracker performance or uh, a, a, a play performance or um, a, a symphony, symphonic performance. We're talking about doing whatever it is in the contract. I mean, it could be those things because obviously a, a performer in a play has a contract and his obligation to the terms of the contract is to perform the contractual obligations, which are the same as performing the play, right? But most contracts aren't about that type of performance. Let's say the contract provides that I'm supposed to make um, uh, 500 widgets in, in 30 days and you're supposed to pay me $10,000. Well, the way I perform is produce the 500 widgets and deliver those to you within the 30 days. The way you perform is you pay me the $10,000. Um, so that's the way that we talk about performance in the law. So um, there are, uh, the, the performance option here is what I consider kind of the happily ever after of contract law. This is what we expect to happen. That's why we entered into the contract because we expect um, Bob to do what he's supposed to do and we expect Larry to do what he's supposed to do under the terms of the contract. And most of the time, that's exactly what happens. People do what they're supposed to do in the contract. After all, they chose to enter into the contract. They knew what the deal was. They don't necessarily want to suffer any negative repercussions from breaching their contract. So they do what they said they would do and everybody's happy at the end. I mean, this, was, this is what happens probably 95 or more percent of the time. This is the usual course of events. But things can interfere with performance. And so we're going to talk about some scenarios in which there's some uh, problem with performance. Imagine that I have um, a business in which I paint uh, rooms in people's houses. And uh, Larry has hired me to paint his living room and dining room. And our contract provides that I'm supposed to be at his house at 8 a.m., on the, the 13th of this month with all of my equipment and my work crew and that we will go in and we will paint these two rooms on that particular day on the 13th. Well, we show up at Larry's house at around 745. We unload our truck. Uh, we get all the drop cloths. We get all the paint. We get all of the paint brushes and the ladders and everything else that we will need for that task. All of the workers are there. Uh, we uh, get the, the, the truck unloaded. We knock on the front door at Larry's house at about, we'll say, 7.59 p.m. There's no answer. We ring the doorbell. There's no answer. Uh, we look in the windows. House looks dark. I mean, we can see the living room and dining room as we look in the window, but obviously we can't go inside. We wait a few minutes. We knock on the door a little bit more insistently this time. We, not, we ring the doorbell a little bit louder. 
there's still no indication of anyone being inside the house. I call the number that I have for Larry. There's no answer. I send a text message to the number I have. I get no response. I send an email to his number. Still no activity. I don't know what to do. We continue knocking on the door. We continue trying to call his number. We stay there until 9 a.m. We have yet to hear any um, uh, indication that anybody's in the house and we haven't gotten any reply. At this time, we have tendered our performance because we have indicated that we are ready, willing, and able to perform just as we have provided under the contract. Obviously, we can't break into Larry's house and start painting his house without permission. I mean, if the job had been to paint the exterior of his house, I suppose we could have started. Or if our job were to, say, uh, uh, do some landscaping or cut the, the lawn or something along those lines, we wouldn't need him to, to be there. But to, to paint the house, we need someone to let us in. And so we, we can't perform without the cooperation of somebody else. And so uh, we will have tendered our performance. By tendering our performance, we have, uh, we have, we're not going to be in a situation of breach. So let's say uh, three o'clock that day, Larry gives me a call. He says, hey, Groover, you were supposed to paint my, my house today. Y'all aren't here painting. And I say, well, Larry, you know, we were here at eight o'clock as the contract provided. We knocked and rang the doorbell repeatedly. We called you. We sent you a text. We sent you an email. Uh, but we didn't get any response from you. We tendered performance. It's not our fault that we weren't able to perform. It was you who is our fault for not letting us in. So Larry can't complain about us breaching our contract. We have discharged our duties under the contract by tendering our performance. Okay, let's think about another scenario. This time, Larry is there. He opens the door when we ring the doorbell at 7.59 p.m. We go in and we start satisfying the terms of the contract. We remove furniture that we need to in order to paint. We put drop cloths over the carpeting. We put a tape over the wainscoting and, and other features that, that shouldn't get paint. We take down the curtains. We um, uh, paint uh, the, the, the room, the colors that were specified. We do a careful job so that there are no drops of paint anywhere that they're not supposed to be. When we're done painting, and the paint has fully dried. We go back and move the furniture back to where they're supposed to be. We rehang the curtains um, and uh, we remove all of the supplies that we have, the ladders, the drop cloths, the tape. And Larry comes in and he looks at the work. He says, wow, this looks great. You did exactly what you were supposed to do. And so our, our duty to perform has been completely discharged by complete performance. We did what we said we would do. And when we do that, we can stop doing it because we're, we're done at that point. But that's not the way every task is. Imagine that I am hired by an eccentric billionaire to build his dream house. And I mean, it's a huge, huge house. It's got uh, 20 bedrooms. It's got 20 bathrooms. It's got two kitchens, it's got a bowling alley, it's got an indoor pool, it's got an outdoor pool. Uh, you know, every feature you can think of this house has. A gold lame walls, expensive chandeliers, uh, expensive marble, and just, you know, every, uh, every feature you can imagine. Anyway, um, we enter into a contract. Obviously, it's very detailed. He specified lots of different provisions, and uh, we start building the house, and we're building from the ground up, so I hire lots of contractors. Uh, there's, there's plumbers that we need. There's electricians. We need people to lay brick. We need people to frame the house. We need people to install various appliances. Lots of different tasks, lots of different teams, and these teams have to work together and communicate. And whenever there's a project this big, there's going to be a few glitches. There's going to be a few things that don't work out perfectly. But in this particular uh, transaction, we really were able to get a, get, uh, meet up with a lot of success. Really, there was really only one 
uh, error that was made um, in one of the guest bedrooms again there are 20 bedrooms one of the guest bedrooms one of the closets is three inches too narrow now it doesn't affect the functionality of it you can still walk in it you can still hang uh, clothes in it you can still store clothes in it it still has all the functionality but it is three inches more narrow than the 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 plans provided for it to be uh, somebody misread the the blueprint and and didn't get the measurements quite right um, and uh, as a result of, of this error it caused their other rooms to be moved three inches farther down so it would be a difficult problem to fix after the fact without taking three inches from another room for example well our billionaire guy is a stickler for details he has discovered that this one closet in this remote part of the house is three inches too short he comes uh, we've we've uh, he's toured the house and uh, the, the contract price for this house was it was going to be ten million dollars he looks at the house and he goes Grover have you seen this closet here it's three inches too short and he takes me there we measured I look at the original contract and I agree yes you're right it should be three inches wider than it is I apologize it certainly wasn't my intention to provide you with a closet that did not meet your specifications um, but that's a pretty trivial uh, uh, error it's hard to see how that's going to materially affect the value of your house and the guy goes well I'm not going to pay ten million dollars for a house with a closet that's three inches too short, uh, I'm only willing to pay two million dollars for the house now. I say, wait a second, are you saying that my breach of the contract by having the closet be three inches short, keep in mind this is only one of 20 bedrooms, that that breach is worth six million dollars? Well, that might be the opinion of the billionaire, but the reality is the court would find that I, in fact, substantially performed. It would be impossible, uh, given human uh, abilities and, and human limitations, to complete a project of that scope and have every single solitary aspect of it perfect. And that's the way it is for most involved projects. There's going to be a few errors made. So the test is, were nearly all the terms met? And was there an honest effort to satisfy all the terms? And is it true that there was no willful departure from the terms of the document? If the answers to all three of these questions are yes, um, then there is substantial performance. Now this doesn't mean that the billionaire can't sue me for this missing three inches, but he's probably gonna get, I don't know, $1,000? Maybe not even that much, uh, because it would be difficult to show that really the value of his house has declined by a significant amount. It certainly would not be a significant drop. He would still be entitled to pay the vast majority of that sum of money. Okay, well, sometimes a contract will actually specify that something needs to be completed to the satisfaction of somebody else. Maybe that's the one of the terms that we had that I had with my contract with the billionaire and he's clearly not satisfied he wants those three inches of his closet and so you might say well maybe you substantially performed but when the standard is what the billionaire thinks and he's not satisfied that doesn't sound like substantial performance well when you have one of the parties uh, be the measuring stick for the substantial performance uh, you can either establish as an objective standard or a subjective standard. We've talked about the difference between objective standards and subjective standards before. Hopefully you've, you've nailed this down in your, in your minds uh, so that you're familiar with the distinction, but let's just do a little bit of a review to solidify that information. An objective standard is one that is not unique to a particular person. It doesn't consider their quirks and their personal interests and their personal agendas. It's what an, a reasonable person on the sidelines would do, a disinterested person looking at the situation. Going back to my billionaire's mansion scenario, a reasonable person would look at that house and say, gosh, if the only thing that's off is three inches in a minor closet, that sounds like a pretty darn good job. An objective standard, a reasonable person standard would say, yeah, you nailed it. 
great job. Uh, there might be some trivial adjustment to the price, but that looks pretty darn solid. A subjective standard, though, would say, well, you know what? It's not whether a reasonable person would do this, it's, it's whether or would agree with it. It's whether this particular person would agree with it. And that person might have all kinds of quirks. It might be that, you know, the, the billionaire has this special fascination with closets. And he really considers the most important room in the house the closet. And he really just values that really, really intensely. And most of us would say, that's weird. That's not a normal way of viewing the world. It's certainly not a reasonable person standard. But the billionaire could say, look, I'm not reasonable. I'm not normal. I'm not typical. I'm pretty darn unusual. But I'm allowed to have my quirky preferences if I want to. And if that's what the term of the contract specify, then that's what the that's what we'll do for the, our contract. And so it is possible under contract to require that performance uh, be to the satisfaction of the parties and you can apply a subjective standard to that. So if we applied a subjective satisfaction standard, the billionaire subse subjective standard, then I may not have fully performed the contract given the fact that I have three inches off of the closet. Okay, so now we've, we've talked about performance, which again is the happily ever after, the 95% uh, way that discharge happens, 95% of the time way contracts are discharged. Now we're going to consider the issue of consider, uh, see, conditions, how conditions play out in the area of contract law. Okay, um, many contracts include conditions, and we call those contracts Conditional contracts, big surprise there, right? So what is a conditional contract? Well, it's a contract that becomes enforceable only upon the happening or termination of a specified condition. And we can have, they, we can have these uh, play out in three different scenarios. Um, a pre condition precedent, and, and when I see this expression, it's, it's a little bit odd to our English speaking or English hearing ears, I guess because we usually, in English, put the adjectives in front of the nouns. Um, we can see here that condition is a noun and precedent is a, an adjective. Now, this might be the way that uh, this might be written if, these were, if this were a French term or a Spanish term. Uh, many languages put the adjective after the noun. But actually, it may be a better way of looking at this expression is to call it a preceding condition. That would be a more typical uh, way of describing it in English. And so let's look at it from this perspective. Before we, t before we talk about it from this perspective, let's just uh, acknowledge kind of where this, this style of speech comes from. For several hundred years, after 1066, after William the Conqueror invaded and took over England, um, the language in the court systems in England was Norman French. So it's not surprising that given the fact that the language of the court system for hundreds of years was French, that we have some remnants of French in the way that we use legal terms. We're used to seeing Latin in, in these expressions, but it's also not surprising or unusual to see French expressions. But we can also again turn it into an English procession. So we have here preceding. Pre, of course, means before, and seed means to happen. So this is a condition that must happen before. So this is a condition that must happen before um, the contract goes into effect or has teeth. So I like to think of this as an on switch. This turns on the contractual obligation. A good example of that would be, let's say I want to buy Larry's house. We've negotiated the price and all the details, but I say to Larry, listen, Larry, I want to buy your house. I think I can buy your house, but I do need to uh, borrow some money to do so. And I have not actually been qualified for a loan, so I'm going to have to go out to a lender and get approved for the loan. I think I'll be approved. I hope I'll be approved. I'll certainly work hard to be approved, but I can't guarantee I will be. And if I can't be approved, then I can't close on the house. I can't buy your house. So a condition precedent to me being able to buy your house is me being able to secure financing. When I secure it, the, on, the, the light switch goes to the on position 
and the contract goes in force. But if I'm not able to secure financing, the light switch never turns on and I have no obligation to buy your house. If Larry agrees to those terms, then we have a condition precedent. That's one type of conditional contract that we can have, but there's another type of conditional contract we can have, which is condition subsequent. And you can see it's written in a similar way. We start with the noun, we have the adjective. Um, you could just actually switch these words and say a subsequent condition. And of course, this is something that happens after in a sequence. So the, this is a condition that interferes with an already existing contractual duty. It turns off the obligation. It's an off switch. So going back to my contract with Larry, this time I've been pre-approved for my loan, so I don't have to worry about a condition precedent. But I tell Larry, listen, Larry, I want to buy your house, and I think I will be able to buy your house, but I want to let you know that there's been some layoffs happening at work, and we've been told that the layoffs will be done on Friday. I don't think I'll be laid off, but I can't be certain. And so at 5 o'clock on Friday, I'll know one way or the other. If I'm laid off, I can't afford to buy the house at this time. And so if I'm laid off, that would be a condition subsequent. It would turn off my obligations under the contract. If I'm not laid off, then the condition subsequent hasn't happened and my, condition, my contractual obligations will continue. I'll know one way or the other by 5 o'clock on Friday. Um, that would be a condition subsequent, assuming that Larry agrees to that. So you can see condition precedent turns on the light switch, condition subsequent turns off the light switch. We'll go through this, well actually let's flip over and look at the example right now on slide nine. Okay, so uh, Larry and I enter into the contract here. I go looking for that, uh, uh, go to the bank to get the mortgage. I am able to secure alone at this point so now the light switch turns on for the first time I have obligations to perform the terms of the contract that's the second that it begins when we get this approved when we get the loan but you know what we had not just a condition precedent we also had a condition subsequent I have to be able to survive till Friday as an employee if I survive until Friday then um, my condition precedent key is, is still on, so I have con continuing obligations. But let's say I'm one of the unlucky ones. My boss comes into my office at 4.55 on Friday and says, I've got some bad news for you. I'm laying you off. And uh, so I pack up my bags, leave the office, and on the way home I call Larry. Hey, Larry, guess what? The condition subsequent happened. I uh, have lost my job, so therefore my obligations under the contract turned off. The light switch goes off, and so at this point I don't have any cont continuing obligations under the contract. That gives you kind of a bit of a timeline as to how that works. So we've talked about conditions precedent and conditions subsequent. There's a third category though, and this category is probably the most common, and it's such an intuitive idea that usually people don't even think about it being concurrent conditions. And this happens when the two parties are uh, supposed to do something at the same time. So imagine that I am selling uh, you my car and you are supposed to pay me ten thousand dollars for the car well most likely I expect you to give me a cashier's check for the ten thousand at the same time I'm surrendering the car to you I don't want I'm not going to give you the car he's the car without some money from you similarly you aren't going to be willing to pay me ten thousand dollars unless you're getting the keys to the car those two events are going to happen at the same time. If you show up on the appointed time and you say, oh, I forgot the cashier's check, but I can go ahead and take the keys to the car, I'm going to say, uh, no, you can't. I'm not giving you any keys. You need to go home and get that check. Similarly, if, if we both show up at the appointed time and you've got the check and you say, where's the car? And I'll say, oh, gosh, I forgot the car at home, but I'll go ahead and take the check. You'll be like, no, you are not getting this check. I need the keys to the car before I give you the check. That would be a situation of concurrent conditions. Both parties have to be able to meet their conditions in order for the other party to be required to meet the condition. 
most of the time conditions are express, meaning that it's clear under the circumstances. Um, people have either stated it if it's an oral contract or written it out if it's a written contract, those particular requirements. Going back to my example, our actual contract most likely says if Groover can't secure financing, she doesn't have to buy the house. Or if Groover is laid off, she doesn't have to uh, uh, buy the house. Um, usually, they're going to be expressly stated. I mean, that's obviously a best practice. But sometimes the condition is implied. It's obvious under the circumstances. Perhaps it's so obvious that it seems silly to have to even explicitly state that. It can be inferred based upon the language in the contract and the circumstances. So let's say that um, I am a portrait painter and um, I uh, am supposed to paint your portrait and you have given me 60 days to complete the portrait. But you refuse to sit for the portrait and you refuse to provide me with any of your pictures. I've never met you before. I have no idea what you look like. So I can't begin working on the portrait until I have some data to, to work with. I don't know if you're a man or a woman, whether you've got a full head of hair or you're bald, brown, blue eyes, green eyes, whether you've got brown hair, blonde hair, no hair, red hair, white hair. Um, I can't really start. So an implied condition of my contract would be that you would provide me with either your time so that you'd post for the picture or some medium that includes um, a, a representation of you, photographs, video, something along those lines. So we've talked about the first two types of discharge that can happen. Uh, performance is one category. Also the happening of a condition, this would be a condition precedent. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the happening of a condition, I'm sorry, this would be a condition subsequent. This would be a condition subsequent. The condition subsequent turns off the obligation so discharge happens. And the other would be a condition precedent. The condition precedent never happens. I never secure financing. So this would be the condition precedent. Under those circumstances, my obligation to the contract would be discharged. Alternatively, you know, I show up with the keys to the car, but you don't show up with your cashier's check. I don't have to surrender the keys to the car to you. So we've completed our first two methods of discharge, and now we're going to talk about material breach by one or both of the parties. So what is a breach? Well, a breach occurs when one party fails to perform his or her obligations under the contract. We call it a breach. Of course, there can be kind of two categories of breaches. One would be a material breach, and of course, when we use the word material, we're not talking about fabric, we're talking about significant breach, one that has real impact upon uh, uh, the other party. Um, and um, here, here's a definition of material breach. It's a substantial brief of a breach of a significant term or terms of a contract that excuses the non-breaching party from former, further performance under the contract and gives the non-breaching party the right to recover damages. So that's a material breach. But a lot of breaches aren't material. Going back to our substan uh, substantial performance situation, when I delivered that house with a three inch shorter closet than it ought to have had, that was a breach. It was just a minor breach. So some breaches, minor breaches, don't excuse the other party from performing under the contract. So the fact that I uh, provided that house with that very small error did not excuse the billionaire from paying his money, his $10 million to me. If it did excuse him from paying that amount of money, you could see how no one would ever be willing to, to construct a um, multi a million dollar house because they would know that there would be some little detail they would get wrong. And so that's not a very practical solution. So uh, an important, uh, when, there, when a breach occurs, it's important to distinguish between a minor one and a material one. If it's a material breach, let's say I had left off one of the kitchens, for example. Well, then the main air would billionaire would be in a position to say, this is a material breach. I am not required to go forward with this contract. 
And of course, in a material breach, one party, in this case me, unjustifiably failed to substantially perform its obligations in the contract. I mean, I should have noticed I'm supposed to put two kitchens in, right? There's another type of breach, and this is going to be a, a type of material breach, actually. It's called anticipatory breach. Okay, imagine here, we have this young, young lad here. He uh, got home from school that day, and uh, he said to his mom, Mom, I'd love to have some ice cream. Can I have some ice cream as a snack? Mom says, well, Tommy, I, I, uh, I want you to have a good dinner. He goes, oh, I'll, I'll eat everything that, that you put on my plate if I can just have ice cream now. And, Tommy's, and then mom says, well, Tommy, you know, we're having broccoli tonight. Are you willing to eat the broccoli? Tommy says, well, if, if I can have ice cream now, sure, I'll be willing to eat broccoli then. So mom scoops out a couple of scoops of vanilla ice cream in the bowl and puts some sprinkles on it and some hot fudge sauce. And Tommy goes to town on it. He eats every little bit of his ice cream. And um, he puts the bowl in the sink and goes about his business. So now it's dinner time. And so he has, his mom has performed under the terms of the contract. And so um, he's been eating his, his food. There's a, 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 some, some, a pork chop, there's some carrots, and then there's the, the feared broccoli there. Well, Tommy has no trouble eating the pork chop. He has no trouble eating the, uh, the carrots, but when, when it comes time to eat the broccoli, he refuses. So his mother says, Tommy, remember, you said that you were going to eat your broccoli. And so mom puts the broccoli spear onto her fork, but at, even before it gets to his mouth, Tommy puts his hand over his mouth. That action tells the mom that Tommy is anticipatorily breaching. He's saying, look, I'm letting you know, even before you get that piece of broccoli to my mouth, that I am not going to eat that broccoli. I am breaching our agreement. Um, you know, really, I could, could keep my hands down by my side and wait until that fork is touching my lips before I breach, but I'm not going to wait that long. I'm going to tell you ahead of time, I'm not eating that broccoli. Well, that's what anticipatory breach is. Let me give you a more practical story along those lines. Um, imagine that I'm in a contract with you. I'm a widget maker. You want to buy my widgets. I'm supposed to deliver these widgets to you on November 1st. Um, I am supposed to deliver a thousand widgets at the time. Um, on uh, October 20th, my widget machine that would make your widgets explodes. It is completely unrepairable. I'm going to have to order a new widget machine, but uh, the, the widget machine that I need is on back order. There aren't any available in the market that I can purchase, and they're not going to be able to deliver one until November 12th. Um, I can, I know I can't repair the one I have. I know that I can't get another satisfactory widget maker um, and I don't have any of these particular widgets that you need in inventory. I can't think of any way I can satisfy the terms of your contract. It's true that I'm not in breach of the contract until November 1st and so I don't have to go and tell you that I'm not going to be able to provide you with the widgets. But there's some advantages for me if I go ahead and confess on November 20th, and I'm going to, excuse me, October 20th, that I'm going to have to breach on November 1st. And so what I might choose to call you up and say, hey, listen, I know today that I'm not going to be able to deliver those widgets by November 1st. I am telling you in advance that I'm not going to be able to satisfy uh, the terms of the contract. Another term for anticipatory breach is anticipatory repudiation. They mean the same thing. When I anticipatorily breach, then you are excused from your performance um, because I breached over a material term. And so you can go out and shop some other company to get those widgets. Um, you don't have to wait until November 1st to start that because I've told you that I'm going to breach. Um, as I said before, there are strategic reasons why a party might anticipatorily breach. Um, but we'll save those for a later, uh, later portion of this chapter to go into the details about that. Okay, let's talk about, so we've talked about performance, we've talked about conditions in contracts, and we've talked about material breach. Now we're going to talk about agreement uh, of the parties, how agreements between the parties 
can result in discharge of their contractual obligations. Okay, so we have four ways this can happen. One is by mutual rescission, one is by substituted contract, one is by accord and satisfaction, and one is by novation. So let's go back to mutual rescission. You can tell by the term mutual that both parties to the contract are involved in this. And you can see that rescission is the noun form of the verb rescind, and this verb means to cancel. So in this situation, two parties have a contractual obligation, but they both decide they don't want this contract anymore. Going back to my example with Larry, let's say that I hadn't included any conditions in my contract. I didn't mention to Larry the small possibility I might be laid off, um, but I do get laid off. I don't want to buy his house anymore. I mean, I, I don't have a legal excuse. I have the obligation to buy, to, to buy his house. Um, at the same time, Larry, who was planning on moving to France, that was why he was selling his house, um, his business opportunity in France falls apart. So he doesn't want to move to France anymore. He'd like to hold on to his house. It's serendipitous that both of us at the same time want to back out of the contract. Well, I call him up and I say, hey, Larry, I really can't close on the house. And Larry says, you know what? I really don't want to close on the house either. So why don't we just tear up this contract? Why don't we both mutually cancel the contract? I mean, if both of the parties want out, who cares if the, if the agreement happens? We're the only ones who have any, any skin in this game. And so, yes, we are able to uh, cancel the contract on our own and thereby discharging both of our obligations under the contract. Okay, so that's one method for a discharge. Another method would be by substituted contract. Um, let's say that uh, uh, we're in that same situation, I have the contract with Larry, and really I don't want to get out of the contract completely, I just need more time. I'm confident that I'll have another job in, you know, I need about another 30 days. If the market is hot, I'm very marketable, and so if I can just get 30 more days to find the job, I can go ahead and close on the house. Larry is also confident that he wants to move. I mean, he's not going to move to France after all, but he, he does want to move into a different house. But, of course, he's going to have to look for a new house. He feels that if he has 30 days to look for a new house, he'll be able to find that house and that he'll be ready to close on our transaction. So now we don't have to mutually rescind. We're just changing the terms of our agreement. So what we could do under those circumstances is... Um, to a substituted contract. The contract would be very similar to our initial contract, but instead of closing on, we'll say, October 27th, we're going to plan on closing on November 27th. And we're going to substitute our first contract and remove any obligations to perform that we have under that contract. And now we have a new contract where we, which we haven't discharged yet and which we do have uh, obligations under the contract. When we're talking about a substituted contract, we're not talking about substituting the parties to the contract. We're talking about changing the terms of the contract. It's different than a novation, which we'll talk about in a second. In a novation, we actually change the parties to the contract. Okay, so let's talk about a third situation in which the parties discharge their obligations by agreement of the parties. And this is by accord and satisfaction, or another term for it is settlement. You can tell by the term there's actually a two-step process here. The first thing that happens in an accord and satisfaction is that the parties reach an accord. They arrive at settlement terms. Uh, usually one party is going to pay the other party a sum of money. And so... For example, let's say I'm the one who breached. We'll go back to the example wherein I did not deliver the widgets that I was supposed to deliver by November 1st. Um, and I agree now because I breached to pay that sum of money. So that's the accord, my promise to pay the sum of money. My satisfaction is when I actually do pay the sum of money. So there's a two-step process. Once both steps are done, I am discharged. My contractual obligations are discharged. I no longer have to feel that I, that I have this, this uh, duty to uh, provide those widgets hanging over my head. I no longer have that responsibility. 
Finally, we have the novation example. And again, this is to be contrasted with the substituted contract. In a substituted contract, we keep the same parties, we just change the terms. Well, in a novation, typically you change one of the parties, possibly two of the parties, but more often one of the parties, and you oftentimes keep the terms of the contract the same. Let's look at an example of how that might play out. You may recall our characters Al, Bob, and Ron from before. Uh, well, we have a little bit different fact pattern, but it's, it's kind of similar to what we had before. We have this initial contract between Al and Bob. Um, Bob is supposed to paint Al's house. And Al is going to pay Bob $1,000 for completing this. But for whatever reason, Bob doesn't want to do it. Maybe he's broken his leg. Maybe he's been, gotten too busy at work and he doesn't have the time to do this. But whatever the reason is, Bob finds Ron. And Ron is willing to paint Al's house for the $1,000. And so what Bob, Bob now goes to Al and says, listen, Al, I know we have a contract for me to paint your house for $1,000, um, but I would like to substitute our contract for another contract. I'd like to, to provide an ovation. And in this new contract, Ron will be the one painting your house for the same price and performing the same services. Would you agree to that? Al probably wants to get some references from Ron to make sure Ron's uh, paint job is of sufficient quality. Uh, and there may be some negotiations, but let's say that Al agrees, okay, Bob, I mean, I'm fine with Ron, I'm fine with you, whatever. And so now the, the contract that Bob and Al were in is discharged, and now there's a new contract between Al and Ron. Now you might be thinking to yourself at this time, well, gee whiz, this sounds like a delegation, doesn't it? Oh, and also an assignment. It sounds like Bob is delegating his duty to paint Ron's house, excuse me, to paint Al's house to Ron, and that he is assigning the asset of the $1,000 to Ron. Um, well, it, an ovation has many things in common with that kind of double assignment slash delegation, but there's an important difference. And that is typically when a, a party to a contract delegates a duty, his his um, responsibility in the contract doesn't go away. He maintains a continuing obligation to make sure that duty is fulfilled. And so if this were a delegation situation and Ron did a bad job painting the house, Al could sue Ron or he could sue Bob. But in the case of a novation, Bob's and Al's initial contract has been discharged. It's no longer at issue. The only contract that survives is Al's contract with Ron. And so Bob has no continuing obligations because there is no true delegation here. He is just removed from the story entirely. The way I remember novation is that it's like the word innovation. It's just you remove the first two letters from innovation, you have the word novation. What is an innovation? It's a new idea. Well, this idea of Al, excuse me, of Ron painting Al's house is an innovation or a novation in this case. So now we've covered the first four methods in which contract discharge happens. Performance, a condition, a material breach, or agreement by the parties. Our last category is operation of law. Um, there's actually several different ways that operation of the law can cause a contractual obligation to be discharged. And in fact, this is not an exhaustive list of all the ways that it can, that it can happen. These are just some of the main ones that we're going to, to consider um, in this section. One can be when one of the parties to the contract does something really, really sneaky. They actually alter the terms of the contract. They forge the contract. Or maybe they're the ones who are responsible for typing it up and they add a couple extra zeros or something like that. Well, obviously that's a type of fraud on the party of, part of the other party. And so it's very possible that the court would even say, well, there was no reality of assent, the, the topic that we talked about in chapter 12. But the court could also say that the operation of law would discharge the non-cheater's obligation to the contract. Um, obviously, the alteration has to be intentional and it has to be material. It can't be a trivial point.
but the innocent party can be discharged from the contractual obligations. The logic behind this is that we don't we want uh, our our parties to contracts to, to treat contracts with respect. Um, the, the the courts think of contracts as a pretty important. Um, thing that that needs to be treated with with a lot of respect and and uh, I use the word sanctity here that may be a little bit over the top but but that's the idea that we're getting at the courts are definitely not going to reward somebody who's engaged in that kind of misconduct um, from from being able to enforce a contract Another way that operation of law works is in the case of bankruptcy. And we've talked about this in previous situations, but I didn't provide a lot of detail because I knew this day was coming. So let's talk in a little bit more detail about this. Okay, so let's uh, think about the example. And I guess we talked about this in the circumstance of an assignment. And then we talked about how um, assignments are freely given and um, uh, courts are very loath or reluctant to uh, limit assignability of things. Um, and in fact, courts sometimes won't even honor a very clear limitation on assignments in a contract. And one of those circumstances in the, is in the bankruptcy situation. Um, and so let's talk about how bankruptcy interacts with contractual obligations just a little bit. Let me start by saying that I'm not a bankruptcy practitioner and that this is a really, really complex area of the law. We actually have a course in the paralegal program on bankruptcy law. It is LGLA 1343. Um, so if you have more interest in the topic of bankruptcy, and this is both a course that covers personal bankruptcy as, as well as corporate bankruptcies, um, that might be a course that, that might have value to you. But uh, with the caveats that this is a complex subject, I don't practice in that area, let me just touch on a couple of highlights about how bankruptcy law impacts um, uh, 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 discharge. Okay, so I, you and I are in a contract. And I am supposed to, um, uh, well, well, let's say you were supposed to provide me with 10,000 widgets and I'm supposed to pay you $10,000. And I'm supposed to pay you the $10,000 within 30 days of you providing the 10,000 widgets. Well, you provide the 10,000 widgets exactly when you're supposed to. And they are conforming goods. I accept them. But then on the 29th day, right before I'm supposed to pay you, the $10,000 I file for bankruptcy. And it ends up that I don't just owe you $10,000. I have lots of other creditors and I owe them money as well. Um, there's all, some of them are secured, some of them are unsecured. Um, maybe I have a million dollars in debts. So your $10,000 is a pretty small piece of a pretty big pie, so to speak. And my assets, are only $200,000. Now you might be thinking, well, I don't need 200,000, I just need 10,000. So why don't I just take some of that 200,000? Well, I can see why you'd want to, but the courts aren't gonna let you do that because they're gonna say, wait a second, um, Groover doesn't have enough assets to pay everybody 100% of what she owes them. And so we'll have to look at the statute and figure out who has priority how many people are going, you know, and, and even the people who have priority, the secured folks, um, people first in line to get the money, they still probably aren't going to get 100% of what they're owed. Um, they're, they're probably going to be receiving, you know, maybe 50% or 40% or of what they owed. Um, and so in that situation, let's say that even though I was supposed to pay you $10,000, I only am required by the bankruptcy court to pay you $4,000. Now you're thinking to yourself, well, Groover still owes me $6,000. I mean, gosh, the cost of me making the widgets was more than $4,000. I lost money on this deal. I still want the other, I mean, I'm glad to get the $4,000, but I still want six more thousand. Well, you won't be able to sue me for that because that duty that I had to pay that full amount was discharged in bankruptcy. 
and so I no longer owe that to you as a result of my status as a bankrupt. So let's go back to that assignment issue that I was talking about before. In an assignment situation, let's say that um, under the terms of our agreement that uh, I am not supposed to be able to assign those 10,000 widgets to anybody else. Um, I don't know why, you'd, record, why you'd, you'd put that limitation, but let's just say that was a limitation in our contract. So I file for bankruptcy, so all of my assets are now available to the bankruptcy court for distribution. And it might be that that would be a good item to um, uh, provide to one of my creditors. Maybe one of my creditors would have that would see a value to having those 10,000 widgets. And so the bankruptcy court would have the authority to take my 10,000 widgets um, and distribute those to somebody else despite the existence of an anti-assignment clause in the contract. The bankruptcy court can ignore that term as it divides up my assets. So We've talked about the alteration of the contract. We've talked about bankruptcy, which is the second category of discharge by operational law. Let's talk about the tolling of the statute of limitations. A little bit of a review about a statute of limitations. A statute of limitations is the length of time a person has to file a lawsuit. It varies depending upon the uh, type of claim that the person is advancing. Um, the statute of limitations for a breach of contract case is going to be four years. You do need to know this answer. So let's say that going back to the example of you providing me 10,000 widgets and I'm supposed to pay you, well, this scenario, I don't file for bankruptcy. And you write me a letter, hey, Gregory, you haven't paid me. And you write me another letter and another letter. And I don't pay you. And I consistently don't pay you. Anyway, it's now been three years, 11 months, and 27 days. And um, you start thinking to yourself, hmm, I never got that money from Groover. And so you wait a few more days, and now it's been four years and two days. And so um, you come to me and go, Groover, I'm going to sue you. You still owe me that $10,000. And I say to you, well, actually, I don't because the statute of limitations has expired. Uh, you no longer have a valid lawsuit against me. You did, you had a great lawsuit even just a few days ago because I clearly was in breach of our agreement, but you waited too long and now you can't successfully sue me, so therefore I have no continuing obligations under the contract. Um, I do list this case, um, the Stein versus Stewart case. You aren't responsible for reading it, but I did want to give you access to information so that you can see the claim here. Let's go ahead and pull up um, the statute of limitations just so we can see this. Here. Let's see, I'm going to get 16 civil practice and remedies. So we go to Texas Statutes, and it'll be the first hit here. We're going to go to the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code, and we're looking for Chapter 16, which is Limitations. I think we're looking for Section 21. Hmm. Did I do the wrong one? Oh, 51, sorry. <laughs> okay, let me flip back here. Let's go to section 51. Every action for which there is no express limitations period except an action for the cover of real property must be brought no later than four years after the date the cause of action accrues. So that's a statutory period for a contract claim, four years. Um, but there are other ways that operational law can remove uh, or discharge a contractual obligation. And one is because of impossibility performance. Impossibility performance is exactly what you think it is. You can't perform because you literally can't perform. Um, but most of the time when we think about impossibility performance, we're really thinking about this category, objective impossibility. Here, the laws of physics preclude us from performing. 
let's say that um, I'm supposed to paint your house. I'm supposed to be there at 8 o'clock on Tuesday morning. Well, Monday night, your house got struck by lightning. It was burned to the ground. There's nothing for me to paint. I can't perform. I'm not in breach because there is nothing. You know, I can put a paintbrush where the walls would have been, but it's not going to stick to the air. And so it is objectively impossible for me to paint your living room and dining room at this point in time. The common ways for objective impossibility to happen is when, you know, the destruction of the subject matter, in other words, the living room is no longer there to paint, or it could be the death or disability of the party when personal services are necessary. Now, that wouldn't be the case for a house painting job. The, house, the, the owner of the home doesn't really care whether Bob or Larry or Teresa or Mary paints the house. He just wants somebody who's skilled at painting houses. But let's say that I hired Claude Monet to do a painting for me. Well, I really want it to be Claude Monet who's doing the paint job for me, right? Who's painting the, the, the putting a paint on the canvas. But let's say he were to, I don't know, die. I mean, it's about time for Claude to pass away, to be honest with you at this point. Anyway, um, and so we hire Bob Monet, his second cousin once removed, who has no artistic talents whatsoever. Um, under those circumstances, it becomes objectively impossible for Claude Monet to complete the painting because, you know, he's dead. Also, subsequent illegality. Going back to my example where in I had the contract with the beer distributor to get a keg of beer every a Friday afternoon. Um, and it was perfectly lawful when the drinking age where I was living was 18, but once it went up to 21 and I wasn't grandfathered, that a beer distributor did not have the legal right to deliver the beer to me. And it became objectively impossible for the beer distributor to legally leave that beer. It wasn't uh, physically impossible. I mean, they could, obviously, it wasn't any more difficult to deliver the beer um, after the law was changed than before the law was changed. But the, the law assumes that parties um, are, do not feel free to violate the law. So that's objective impossibility. But we have another category of impossibility performance, which isn't truly, truly impossible. It's what we call subjective impossibility. And this is where it's just really, really tough to uh, carry out a particular contractual obligation. It doesn't violate the laws of physics um, it, that, uh, but it's, it's still pretty darn tough. Um, objective impossibility discharges the party's obligations, but subjective impossibility doesn't. The fact that it's still possible but very, very difficult usually doesn't uh, remove that person's obligation to satisfy their contractual duties. So subjective impossibility doesn't uh, uh, discharge in most cases. But something very much like subjective impossibility can. Um, so so you, when the, and the, the mechanism that we talk about to accomplish this is called commercial impracticability. It's going to sound a lot like subjective impossibility. And I'm going to be honest with you. It's really hard to make a, a reasoned argument that said, that, that shows where the dividing line between commercial impracticability and subjective impossibility differ. Uh, but let's just look here about the definition that we have for commercial impracticability. It arises when, because of an unforeseeable event, one party would incur unreasonable expense, injury, or loss if that party were forced to carry out the terms of the agreement. Okay. Um, this happens a lot in raw materials cases. Let's say that the widgets I make, um, or the, the raw material that I use to make my widgets, I use an inexpensive metal alloy. It's got a little bit of this, it's got a little bit of that. One of the ingredients in the alloy is ordinarily quite inexpensive. The primary place that we get this is from, um, I don't know its name a stan, we'll say. <laughs> anyway, this country is in the middle of Latin America somewhere, and um, it's very peaceful, and this is the main industry for this particular country. They haven't had any kind of unrest or interruption in its production 
over the last 200 years. This has been a very reliable source for this particular metal. And it's essential for my alloy. If I don't have this particular ingredient for my metal alloy, I can't make my widgets. Um, there's not been any indication that there's going to be any unrest in this country. There's no uh, volcanoes, there's no earthquake lines, this place is not subject to flooding or to tornadoes or anything along those lines. It's not even a high likelihood of, of forest fires or things like that. It's a very peaceful, tranquil place that just doesn't face that many problems in life. And so when we enter into the contract, I have no reason in the world to suspect that I don't know its name is done is going to have any difficulties whatsoever. But the day after we sign the contract, there's this violent coup and there's chaos in the streets, there's fighting, there's bloodshed, the borders are sealed. There is no metal that is leaving that country at this point. And this internal civil war goes on for months, years. And so it's almost impossible to get this metal. Even though it's ordinarily a very inexpensive metal to get, it has now become wildly expensive. And so ordinarily I charge a dollar for each uh, widget that I make and the cost of this metal from I don't know a stan is um, usually just one cent of that dollar cost. Um, but now to get that metal, it actually the, the amount of metal I need per widget would cost me four dollars so every widget I make I'm losing more than three dollars on that would be a situation where commercial impracticability could become an issue um, they it's, as you can see they become the, that raw ingredient has become extraordinarily expensive and or very difficult to obtain because of an embargo war crop failure unexpected closure um, Commercial impracticability is the solution for the, the harshness of the objective impossibility standard. As you can see, it's largely the same thing as subjective impossibility, but for whatever reason, they gave it a new name, they put a little lipstick on the pig, and they decided that we'll go for this one, commercial impracticability. This will be a situation that sometimes wins, that sometimes contractual obligations are discharged. Now, I want to put a few caveats with this. One caveat is that the parties can actually contract to bear these risks of these unexpected conditions. And if I contract to bear the risk, then the court is not going to say, well, it was unforeseeable, but guess what? I'm supposed to have foreseen it. That's my contractual obligation. So under those circumstances, the court is not going to use the commercial impracticability argument uh, to allow me to uh, be, have my contractual obligations discharged. Another thing could be, or another issue is that, that the difference has to be really pretty extreme. Let's say the cost of this metal went from one cent to 50 cents. I might still be losing a little bit of money because maybe when you add up all the other costs of all the other uh, elements of this, it's going to cost me a, a dollar and 10 cents to make every widget. I'm losing 10 cents, but I think the court would likely say, well, 10 cent loss, I mean, that, sometimes that's the way business works out. You don't make money on every uh, contract. Maybe you should have negotiated better. Maybe you should negotiate a better price or um, included in your a contract some provision that provides that when the price of this alloy goes to a certain level, the price of the widgets also rises. Uh, you, you know, the, the courts are, are not likely to let me out of a contract just because I was a poor negotiator. So I don't want you to think that commercial impracticability is a blank check, that the court's just going to let you forget about your obligations just because there's a little uptick in a, con in a, in a raw material price. So this is how uh, at least the uh, restatement of contracts uh, a resource, which is a secondary legal resource, so it's not written by any legislature or by any court, but it's kind of a bunch of legal scholars getting together and trying to distill where the law is in this area. This is what they have said are the important elements to, to situations in which courts might decide to find that commercial impracticability applies and that the parties ought to have their obligations under the contract to be discharged. So these are the three elements, the three factors. That the event occurred 
whose non-occurrence was a basic assumption of the contract. In other words, both parties assumed oh, that's not going to happen. Oh, there's not going to be a civil war in that country. It's too stable. There's no indications of unrest. So that's the first requirement. The second requirement is that continued performance is commercially impractical. Now we can see the price going up to $4 when I'm only earning a dollar. That's pretty commercially impractical. And then finally, that the party claiming discharge did not expressly or impliedly agree to performance in spite of impractibility that would otherwise justify his non-performance. In other words, he did not contract to assume the obligations uh, or the risk of commercial impractibility. So those are the things that the court will likely consider in deciding whether commercial impracticability exists or not. And now let's consider frustration of purpose. This is a very, very fun uh, uh, legal case. It's, these are the coronation cases, and I have some information on this in Canvas. Um, the first thing I want to say about frustration of purpose is it's almost, a loser, almost always a loser argument. So don't hang your hat on this one, but I'm going to tell you the story just because it's so much fun. Okay, this is back um, in, uh, well, as you can see, in the very early 1900s. I think Queen Elizabeth, excuse me, Queen Victoria had just passed away, and her son, Edward the something, I can't remember the number, but anyway, he was going to be crowned. So this was his coronation. As you can imagine, this was a phenomenally important event in England. They were going to have a new king, uh, you know, uh, or new ruler for the first time in a very long time. And so uh, the coronation day was a national holiday. Most people got that day off from work. The people who were in London uh, planned, many of them planned to line the streets and wave their new king as he either went to his coronation or left his coronation. I'm assuming he was being coronate, cor coronated in um, one, some cathedral there. Anyway, so obviously the the uh, monarchy, the, the royal staff, realized this was a major event and they wanted to uh, have the pomp and circumstance uh, commiserate or, or in line with, with that expense. And so they planned a route for the king's uh, carriage to go a around. And obviously they planned the route so that it would cover a fairly significant part of the city of London. So as many uh, Londoners and visitors from the countryside would be able to come in and be able to see the king either on his way to his coronation or on his way away from the coronation. And the route to the coronation was one path and the route away was a different path, allowing, you know, a, as many people as possible to see um, that, that momentous event. So they planned this out. They publicized the routes. And um, obviously most people uh, were planning on just arriving and, and lining the streets and seeing the carriage as it went past. But some wealthier Londonites started thinking, well, why don't we rent a hotel room along the route? We rent a hotel room and then we won't have to be mixing in with a riffraff below us. We'll be able to look from comfort up in, on our balcony and see the king's carriage as it goes by. We'll have a better view and we won't get jostled by the, the, the population down below. And so many people rented hotels along the route that the carriage was supposed to take. As you can imagine, hotels who were fortunate enough to have um, a part of their hotel on the route, they found that some of the hotel rooms were more valuable than others. You know, some of the hotel rooms might be on the wrong side of the street um, or on a different, they face a different street than the route of the coronation uh, uh, path of the, of the carriage. The, the, hotel, the, the hotel rooms that faced that different street, uh, the, the hotel wasn't able to charge any premium for those hotel rooms. But the hotel rooms that faced the, the route of the, of the, the carriage would, would travel were able to get a significant premium. Those hotel rooms, uh, the, the people who rented those rooms were willing to pay several times the ordinary rate for those rooms. And, of course, the hotel gleefully took the money and gleefully agreed to uh, reserve those rooms for those individuals. Well, unfortunately for everyone, kind of in the story, the king got ill. I think he might have had, 
I could be wrong about this, but I think he might have had um, an appendicitis attack. But anyway, whatever it was, he became sick and he was ill for uh, a few weeks. Uh, he survived, fortunately, and he recovered. And so then the uh, coronation was back on. But of course, those people who had reserved the, the hotel room for the initial period of time, uh, they uh, weren't able to take advantage of the hotel room the way they wanted to, to take advantage of it. I mean, the hotel personnel were happy to let them have access to the room at the wildly inflated price, but those people really didn't want the hotel room at that wildly inflated price. Um, they might want the hotel room later on when the uh, king was actually being crowned, but they don't, they didn't want that hotel room on that kind of random day now, now that the king's coronation was going to be delayed. Well, the hotels weren't willing to refund the money uh, for, for the canceled coronation hotel rooms. They said, look, you agree to pay this price. We agree to provide the hotel room. Uh, we did provide the hotel room. You just didn't show up to use it. And so therefore you need to, we're going to hold on to the money because in most cases the people prepaid for these rooms. We're going to hold on to our money because uh, you voluntarily entered into this contract. Well, the hotel patrons who had prepaid for the room said, but you knew what was going on. You knew that we were only renting these rooms to see the king get crowned. And when he didn't get crowned, there was a frustration of purpose. The reason that we were in the rooms, we couldn't get, uh, we couldn't uh, uh, meet that purpose because of the cancellation. In other words, the, the, that the king's carriage would pass by this route was a basic assumption of the contract. Both parties, both the hotel and the people renting the rooms, saw that as a necessary aspect of this particular contract. And since neither party had assumed the risk of the non-occurrence, the contract should be discharged. And so therefore the court said, hotels, you have to return the money. Uh, so this is a possible uh, way of, of challenging a contract in those rare circumstances like the coronation cases. But I do want to let you know that there's very, very few cases other than the coronation cases that have applied this frustration of purpose uh, doctrine. So it's not a common category for winning. Um, it's kind of related to the commercial impracticability argument. That's probably a more likely argument to be successful on. So now we've gone through the five ways that an obligation under a contract can be discharged. First, through performance. Uh, the second, through the happening of a condition, if it's a condition precedent, uh, or uh, to the failure of a condition, if it's a condition subsequent. Um, then we had when one party materially breaches, then the obligation of the other party is discharged. Then we talked about the various ways that we can have an agreement between parties that uh, discharges the obligation. We talked about discharge by mutual rescission, discharge by substituted contract, discharge by accord and satisfaction, and discharge by novation. And then our final category this isn't an exhaustive list, but we've talked about how operation of law can discharge a contractual obligation. And here are the particular categories that we looked at. We looked at alteration of a contract as discharging the obligation for the innocent party. We talked about bankruptcy law. We talked about the tolling or the expiration of the statutory period. We talked about impossibility of performance, specifically objective impossibility. And then we talked about commercial impracticability. Finally, we talked about frustration of purpose. And so now we have gone through all methods in which discharge can occur of a contractual obligation. So we have now completed the first of our two topics in this chapter, discharge. In our next lecture, we will discuss the topic of remedies. As always, if you have any questions about discharge, please feel free to send me an email or come by my office hours or raise your questions in class. I'll be glad to answer them. I thank you for your attention. Have a wonderful day.